Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm going to ask you if you will. We're going to do something a little different on Sunday morning, this morning. I'm going to ask everybody, if you will, stand, stand with me. And everybody come down here for a minute. Come to the front. Uh, we're not going to give, this isn't an altar call. We're not going to turn on the electric shockers that we've got in the altar for people when they come to repent. We're not going to do any of that. Everybody crowd in here. Get in. Move in. <coughs> Every year at Christmas time, the, well, let me explain. The United Pentecostal Church has several offerings that we give every year. We give... It's called Sheaves for Christ. We give to the youth, and we give a, we give a nice offering. We give to Mother's Memorial for the ladies. Uh, we give Save Our Children for our Sunday school. Um, I am pretty involved in, in North American missions uh, because of Church in a Day. Um, my wife and I we, and, and our family and some other folks, but we started a church. We've started five daughter works. So church planning is kind of uh, at, at my heart and seems to have been uh, uh, at the heart of our church. So every year around Christmas time, uh, Home Missions, North American Missions, has an offering that's called Christmas for Christ. And it's an opportunity for us to give to North American missionaries. We've used this, these envelopes the past two years if every envelope is taken and that amount of money is put in that envelope and returned, 
we'll have a $5,000 offering to give to North American Missions. <laughs> and we can do that, and the largest envelope that anyone has to fill for one envelope is $100. They, we have 100 all the way to one. Uh, I've got 100 to 77 and 1 to 24 on this side, and I've got 76 uh, to, what is it, what are those two, How, what is it, 51 and 50 to 25, so I've got 25 to 76 on this side. <coughs> so uh, this morning, always before, I've kind of done it like an auction, you know, I've Stood up here and kind of felt like a hawker. Hey, we'll take the 25, we'll take the 50. No, 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 no. I really don't want to do that. I think what I'd like to do this morning, what I really feel like we ought to do is, uh, I'm going to ask you to pray. We, we've got until the 1st of February. So don't take $5 and think, I'm doing my part, because you've got from now till February. So you could... If you can afford $5 a week, then you can afford $35. Because that's $5 a week for seven weeks. If you can afford $50 a week, you can afford $350. So you could easily take one, two, or three or more of these envelopes. So I'm going to ask you to prayerfully, we're going to pray and we're going to ask God to talk to our hearts. Christmas is more, is about more than just presents and Christmas trees and Santa Claus and reindeer. My God, this year they're fighting about what songs are should be sung or not sung. Our world is upside down in a mess and, and we should portray what Christmas is really all about. So I'm going to ask you to pray before you grab an envelope or two or five or ten and I don't want us to be done until all of the envelopes have been taken. All right, because we've got from now till the first Sunday in, in, in February. And what I want you to do is just simply put a check or the amount of money in that envelope and turn that envelope back in whenever you turn it in, every week or every two weeks or if you wait till the first Sunday in February, I want you to put your money in that envelope. Uh, we're going to give back. We're going to give to God. God's been good to us. We, we are, we're blessed uh, beyond measure. We own all of this, and it's all paid for. Uh, God gives us enough money every month to pay all the bills that we have to pay and to do all the outreach that we want to do and to bring in every preacher, every mus musician, everything. Anything we want to do, God has facilitated a way for us to be able to do everything we want to do. And we're blessed beyond what we can really comprehend. So I'm going to ask you this morning to prayerfully ask God to direct you and lead you. And then I'm going to ask you to pick up enough envelopes that you can do what you feel like God's talking to you to do. All right? So we're going to pray together this morning. Let's pray. God, we love you. <clears throat> we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, in this time of year, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to serve you to be blessed abundantly beyond what we can ask or even really think, God. I pray this morning in the name of Jesus that you would lay on our hearts. Speak to us this morning, God, and lay on our hearts something that we can give back to your kingdom, to be a blessing to somebody who goes to a city that doesn't have truth, goes to a city that doesn't have a church that preaches what we preach, and doesn't feel what we feel every Sunday morning, Ask God that you'd lay on our hearts, uh, maybe even a sacrifice, God. Maybe we would sacrifice uh, and go maybe just a little bit beyond what we're comfortable in giving and that we could give back to you a small portion of the blessing that you've given to us. Speak to us this morning. Guide us and direct us, we pray, God. We want to be a blessing to your kingdom and to the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, amen. I want you to grab some envelopes. Whatever you think you can take. And I don't want you to go back to your seat yet because we're going to get all the envelopes. All right?
but get what you can. We've still got more on this side. There's only a few on that side. If you haven't gotten as much as you'd like to give, the smaller amounts are on this side. still have some more on this side. If you haven't gotten a, a Christmas for Christ envelope, you can get some. Has everybody gotten what they want? There are, uh, there may be a couple on the other side. They're all going on the other side. Everybody got what you want? Thank you for making the sacrifice to give. I'm going to give you another opportunity to give. This is more fun. If any beyond your envelopes, besides your envelopes, if anybody wants a pair of real cool Christmas socks, I can sell you one. I got one pair. I can sell you a pair of Christmas socks for a hundred bucks. If anybody's interested in a pair of Christmas socks, they were five hundred last year. I I. Uh, I suckered Brother Prestwood into paying 500 bucks for a pair of socks. There they are, 100 bucks. All right, thank the Lord. So that means we'll have $5,100 in our offering at least, thank God. Thank you for giving to Christmas for Christ. Now, we're talking about giving it's christmas time we don't i don't spend a lot of time talking about giving but there's one more thing that i do want to ask you to help us with the daycare the school and our church every year we have been asked again to adopt families in our area for help with christmas and um, we have adopted six families that have a total of 18 children um, there are four different ways that you can help us. Through the double doors, there's a bulletin board. And on that bulletin board are Christmas tags. And on those tags, there are gifts. And you can take that tag from the board, buy the items that are on that, wrap them. Don't wrap them. Sorry, don't wrap them. And um, there will be... Bring them and put them under the round table in the center back there, all right? So you can take those tags. The second thing that you can do is you can bring items in for what we're going to call the family box. Um, there'll be boxes in the hall outside the gym on Monday morning. 
with a list of items that are needed. And you can reach into that box, get the item, whatever items you want to buy, get those and bring those back, and you can help us with that. The third way is if you don't want to go and fight people in the stores, you can just simply bring cash, and we will buy gifts. And you can bring those to Ashley Sizemore. Raise your hand, Ashley. So you can bring cash and give it to Ashley Sizemore. And she's going to go shop, and she's going to buy all of that. The fourth way that you can do it is uh, you can help your child's class, the Sunday school class. Each Sunday school class has a stocking. We have 18 stockings, so each class has more than one. We bought stockings for all 18 kids, and uh, each class has stockings. And they will be up in the Sunday school rooms on December 10th, tomorrow. And um, the stockings will be up with the age and the gender of the child. So you can go through there. You can figure out what you want to help us with to give those children gifts. So you can help with the board. Uh, you can help with the family box outside the gym. You can give cash or you can help us with the stockings, all right? But we're gonna sponsor six families with 18 children, and the Lord will bless you for giving, all right? Amen. Stand with me, we're gonna start worship. The way we do that here is we give to the little ones and they march, and uh, they march while we sing our first song. And uh, they put money in these jars, and that's gonna go for our next offering. God bless you. Praise 
just can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop praising His name, Jesus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord forever. I can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop praising His name. I just can't stop. Praise in His name, Jesus. I can't stop. Praise in His name, I just can't stop. Praise in His name, I just can't stop. Praise in His name, Jesus. Thank the Lord. God's good. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Praise God. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place today. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, and I'm going to come to you yet another time asking you for something. The ushers are going to come and we're going to take up our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Give and the Lord will bless you. Uh, this isn't going to uh, anywhere else but here, and it's going to take care of everything that we do. Next Sunday, the Chandlers are going to be with us in service. They will also be with us Saturday night at the church Christmas banquet. That's from 5 to 8. There is, is there a sign-up sheet out there for the banquet? No sign-up sheet. Everybody is invited to come to the to Christmas banquet. There's not, we don't have a sign-up sheet but we're going to have a Christmas banquet in the Family Life Center Saturday, this coming Saturday, 5 o'clock. We're going to start eating at 5 o'clock. Everybody, please come. We're going to have a great time. My wife and I are going to prepare it and serve it. We want to do that for the church, all right? So you be here Saturday at 5, and uh, I think it's going to be prime rib and uh, London broil. And No, it's not. But it will be good. We'll cook good food, I promise. But it's not going to be prime rib and London broil. And then um, Friday is the daycare program, Friday evening. We've got service Thursday night. Ladies' devotion is Tuesday morning at 930. There's prayer here in the morning from 7 to 8 on Monday mornings. And then today, right after service, when service is over, the Sunday school department is having their Christmas uh, party for all the Sunday school kids. So we've got a lot going on this week, something every day, but uh, an idle mind is the devil's workshop, and we don't want that to happen around here, amen? Praise God. Brother Anderson, ask God to bless the tithe and offering. Amen. Give, and the Lord will bless you. 
Amen. God's good. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. While you're standing, we're going to go to prayer. And um, we have several things that we need to remember in prayer. I'm looking for something. I'm looking for something. Um, Sister Donna went to the hospital last night and um, has an infection in her body, and she is sick. And uh, so she's home this morning. We need to remember her. Gary McLean is uh, Barb and Donna's brother-in-law, and he's had a bone cancer for quite a while. Uh, hasn't had to really have any kind of treatment on it until just they have found now that he's got a couple of masses in his upper body and so they're going to have him do uh, chemo and radiation both and so we need to remember uh, Gary, pray that God would touch Gary and heal him of that. We need to remember Brother Petruzzi's foot, it's healing better, getting better every day but he's got a blood clot in his leg we need to pray God just helps that thing to dissolve and go away for the foster, uh, the doctors have told him that uh, his prostate, he's got a, a problem. Most likely, uh, he has prostate cancer. So we need to pray that God uh, will heal Brother Foster. And then um, Ashley went last week to have a mass taken off of her knee. And they took it off and ran tests. And they called her Thursday and uh, <clears throat> Ashley has bone cancer. And uh, it's very aggressive. And she has an appointment Tuesday morning at 9.30. So we're going to the Simon Cancer Center Tuesday morning at 9.30. I'm sorry. We're going to trust God, Sister Petruzzi. I want you to walk in this morning. You don't have your hat on today. Gave me hope. Gave me hope. We're faithful for times like this. This is why we're faithful to God. This is why we live for God every day. This is why we don't waver in our faith. This is why we pray every day. We trust God every day. We live for God with everything that we've got in our heart every day. Because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. When God told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham said, God, Lot lives there. And basically, God really said, I don't care if Lot lives there. I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Its wickedness has come up before me, and I'm going to destroy it. And Abraham said, God, if I, if I could find 50 souls, would you save it? for 50 souls. And you know what God said? For you, Abraham, if there's 50, I'll save it. And that got Abraham's attention. And he said, God, what if I could find 40 souls in Sodom and Gomorrah? Would you save Sodom and Gomorrah if I could find 40 souls? And you know what God said? For you, Abraham, I'll save it if you can find 40. Abraham bargained God all the way down to 50 souls and 15 souls. And every time Abraham asked God, God said, for you, Abraham, I'll save the city. You know why? Because Abraham was the father of the faithful. Abraham was faithful to God. And regardless of what the problem was that was facing Abraham, God said, because you have been faithful, I'll hear your cry. 
We are faithful to God, not because everything goes right. We're faithful to God, not because everything's wonderful and we're living on the mountaintop and all of the blessings of God are flowing our way because everything's going our way. We're faithful <coughs> to God because we don't know what tomorrow holds. And we're faithful to God because He's faithful to us and because when we need to, we can call on our faithfulness. We can ask God to heal. So I'm asking you to remember Ashley, Ashley our family, and uh, pray that when we go Tuesday, we don't even really know what's going on. When we go Tuesday, we'll get a good report. You don't know what's going to happen in your family. You don't know what's going to happen in your life. And uh, I'm not bragging, but I've been faithful. My wife has been faithful. We've been faithful. And I believe God's going to honor that. Every time I've talked to God since Thursday, I've told him, I've reminded God, God, I have been faithful. I've been faithful. And I'm expecting God to do great things. I'm expecting God to heal Gary. I'm expecting God to heal Brother Foster. I'm expecting God to take that blood clot from Brother Petruzzi. I'm expecting God to heal Donna. Because I've been faithful. And I can call on that. And I can trust God. We've got needs on the screens behind us. How many of you have a need? Do you believe God answers prayer? I believe he answers. Let's go to the Lord right now. Let's pray. God, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Jesus name, touch him right now, God. Touch him right now, God. Send him this morning, God, in the name of Jesus. God, you're able, we believe you, we trust you right now in the name of Jesus. God, you're able, Jesus name.
even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you never stop. Oh, you never stop. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you never stop. Oh, you never stop. when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working.
Lift your hands and love him this morning. He's a way maker. He's a way maker. Thank God. He's a promise keeper. Praise God. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We don't praise Him because the sun is shining. Because the sun doesn't always shine. We don't praise Him because there's food on our table. There's not always food on our table. We don't praise Him because everything's going the way we want it to go. Because everything doesn't always go the way that we always want it to go. But He's always God. He's always God. And that's why we praise Him. Because He's always God. And there are no attributes about God that bring despair. Only attribu attributes about God that bring hope and peace and love. So we worship whether, whether, there's, whether the sun's shining or whether it's not because he's God. And whether there's food on the table or not because he's God. And he never changes. He never changes. And he told us his grace was sufficient for where we're at. I'm glad for that, aren't you? Amen, amen. I'm glad for that. Amen. Love everybody that's here. You might. I'm going to preach. Is that all right? I'm just going to preach so you can probably make your way back to your seats. And I won't be long. The word long is relative. There's 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. So if you compare how long I'm going to preach to a week, I'm not going to be long. We had a great time last night. The men, the, the women, when they do white elephant, you can be seated. I'm not even going to read a text this morning necessarily to, to start. We'll read our text after we get into it. When they do white elephant gifts at the women's things, they're always funny gifts. Now, there was a little humor. Uh, Brother Prestwood grabbed a bag, and it said Victoria's Secrets on it at the men's Christmas party. <laughs> I saw Brother um, uh, Odell during the day yesterday, and... Uh, 
I think he prophesied to me. He told me, there's a box, and in that box, there's a, a, a jar of green M&M's. You want the green M&M's. I said, okay. He said, you want those green M&M's. I said, okay. Okay. I had the green M&M's. I opened the box. There was a ball mason jar. It looked to me like it was full of it green M&M's. And uh, make America or keep America great, make Trump president in 2020 ball cap. I thought, you know, Brother Odell, it's a holiday season. The last thing I really need is a jar full of M&M's. I think I'm going to trade those M&M's off on something else. And Brother Bolt got the green jar of M&M's. Being a man of faith that Brother Bolt is, he took the lid to the jar of M&M's off, and when he did, he opened it up to a custom brand new pocket knife. He ate a little bit farther, and there was a Cabela's gift card in there. And uh, I learned a lesson yesterday. When Brother Odell tells me something, I'm taking it to the bank. And uh, Frank Winslow walked away. He had 40 bucks, then he didn't. Then he had 40 bucks, then he didn't. And then he ended up with $40. Tim Dennity got my French press and that bold coffee. I didn't get that either. But I did get something very cool. I got three of Brother Fuller's pocket knives. So I got three pocket knives, that, and they are, man, they are sharp. Uh, and one of them's got a straight razor on it. I did a pretty good job with that this morning. And uh, we had a great time. Uh, we had 80 pounds of wings. We ate a few wings. Tony, we ate a few hundred wings. There are a lot of uh, handicapped chickens in the world this morning after the men's Christmas dinner. We're doing a series. We're in this series, and I've, uh, I want to talk to you this morning. Second, second, I'm going to do three, three messages on outsiders, and this is the second one. My wife and I went on a, on a cruise, kind of sparked a thought for this week. Uh, we went on a cruise in, did we go in May? Or was it March? Sometime in the spring, we went to the Baltics and we went to Denmark and Sweden. And, but we went to, uh, it was a little scary, I'll be honest with you. We woke up one morning and we're docked at St. Petersburg, Russia, comrade. And uh, we got off the ship and went into this big room where... Men really did wear those funny Russian hats and wore those Russian uniforms, and they all were barrel-bellied, you know, just like what you think of. They all looked like, uh, 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 man, Gor not Gorbachev, yeah, Gorbachev, they all looked like him, every one of them, except they didn't have a spot on their forehead. But uh, we went there, and going through customs, I was a little intimidated. I was a little worried. I thought, man, you know. What if they know I'm a red-blooded, die-hard American? What if they know I'm a Cincinnati Reds fan? What if they know I, I uh, like the maize and blue of Michigan in college football? What if they know all of that stuff? What if they realize that I'm a die-hard American? That, will they put me in the gulag somewhere in, in the snow? So it was, it was a little unnerving. But when we went, we saw some amazing things, and we got a history lesson. The Bolshevik rev, rev, uh, Revolution uh, saw the overturning of a dynasty in Russia, the Romanovs. And from Peter the Great to Nicholas II, the Romanovs ruled for 300 years. And like most dynasties, this dynasty was known for its excess. We toured St. Petersburg, and the thing that came to my mind more than anything else was, wow, that's very cool, but that's just too much. That's way over the top. We went to the Winter Palace of Peter the Great and the House of Romanov, and I stood right there at that fountain. Everything that you see that looks like gold, it is gold. And I stood there 
And then we walked up those steps and stood and that fountain that runs down into that pool has a, a, a stream that runs all the way to the Baltic Sea and you can see all the way to the Baltic Sea. We left there and we went to the Hermitage and there are acres and acres of gilded gold ceilings and parquet wood floors. There are two million square feet inside the Hermitage. In, in Paris, the Louvre is famous for all of its paintings. They have almost 400,000 works of art. Inside the Hermitage, there are three million works of art. We couldn't see them all. Everything was gilded with gold or jewels. Uh, the grandeur of it, the over-the-top artistry. It will, as it, it was designed to do, it literally, when you walk into some of those rooms, takes your breath away. And I say all of that to underscore a story. I want to tell you a story about a jeweler by the name of Carl Fabergé. When we told Marshall we were going to St. Petersburg, Russia, the very first thing out of Marshall's mouth to his Grammy was, ooh, the Fabergé eggs. I didn't even really know about the Fabergé eggs. But then we studied about it a little bit because we're going there. Carl Fabergé was contracted by the Romanov family to create a special form of art the Fabergé eggs. He made 50 of them, and they were gifts to the royalty of the Romanov family. And he gave them to them at Easter time. Each one was prized. Each one was made from special precious metals and gemstones. Each one of them was cut in half, either, uh, di either uh, vertically or horizontally. And each one of them contained a surprise when it was open. Each one was so intricate and so valuable and so over the top that they became the abiding symbol of a government that was out of touch with its people and it became corrupt. When the Soviets came to power, a program of turning treasures into tractors unfolded. And of the 50 eggs that they confiscated and sold off, 42 of them are known to have survived. Well, now, now it's 43, but that's a story that we're going to tell later on. Two weeks ago on Sunday morning, we started with a series called The Outsiders, and we read in the book of Matthew about four women that don't, do not fit the story of Jesus, Tamar, Ruth, Rahab, and Bathsheba. Each one of them was an outsider. Each one, though, became a part of the miracle of redemption because the lesson that we learn from those four are you're never too far, you're never too scarred, you're never too unlovely, or you're never too unlovable for Jesus. He still makes something beautiful out of our lives. I told you two weeks ago that we should watch out for the temptation to judge other people. Religious and pious and so-called spiritual ones often try to identify who should and shouldn't be a part of salvation's story because such were some of you. We're never more like Jesus than when we make room for people who have fallen. And we're never more like the world when we exclude people who are struggling in their walk with God. Demons tremble at a church whose hands are reaching out. But demons laugh when a church starts driving people out. God's people are at their best when we reach out, not push out. Today, my focus is going to be on two people, two outsiders. I want to talk to you about two more outsiders. And when the Christmas story was small, just three characters standing in Bethlehem, two men, and one woman with a promise. They were the forgotten. They were the forgetful. And so today I'm going to read in Luke chapter 2. 
verses 1 through 3. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one, into his own city. Verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, Nazareth, into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they went there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Those words trip off of our tongues as we relive the story of Christmas. But have you ever stopped to consider really the meaning of those words? Because we hasten on to the more spectacular thing. We want to talk about the wise men and the angels and the animals that were there. But here in these seven verses are the misery amid the majesty. It's the black velvet backdrop behind the Christmas story where all the, glim, the gems gleam. It's the gritty background for a glorious promise. It's all about the first seven verses are about taxation and decrees and inconvenience and tyranny. A long, tedious trip for a woman who's expecting to have a child. She didn't have a midwife there to help her. There was no woman there beside her to encourage her. The Bible said she brought forth her son. She delivered her own baby boy. She must have been a brave teenage girl. No mother, no sister, no female cousin to wrap the child. She wrapped the baby herself. She didn't do it in a robe of purple because he was a king. Not in the, not in the, in the regalia of the Romanov dynasty. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Strips of cloth that she found. And she laid him in a manger. A feed trough. His majesty in a manger. Our savior laying in a stable. And all the while there were two men that were near. The forgotten man and the forgetful man. Joseph is the forgotten man. He's forgotten because he simply was obedient. Every year it's a dilemma when nativity scenes are put up. Everybody knows who Mary is and where Mary should go. She's the only woman there. Everybody knows who the baby Jesus is because he's the only child present. If the three wise men are put together in a mold, we know who they are. They're the three wise men. We all know the angels because they have wings. We know the shepherds because they have their staves. But it's often a task to try to figure out which one is Joseph. And then when we figure out who Joseph is, we got to figure out in all this all of this story, where does Joseph belong? Mary had her Magnificat. The angels had their in excelsis Deo. Joseph, there's no song about Joseph. There's no words about Joseph. He was silent, but he was instantaneously obedient to what God told him. We forget ourselves if we forget about Joseph. Because Joseph was an outsider in the Christmas story. We know, the Bible tells us, we read it in Luke, Joseph was espoused to, mar to be married unto Mary. Espousal and marriage in biblical times in the Hebrew world was a two-step process. 
The first step was a covenant that was made years before they were ever married when Mary was pledged to be Joseph's wife. It could have happened when she was as young as 12 or 13 years old. The initial pledge usually takes place. And years later, they took the next step. You would go on and you'd have the formal marriage. But between the first and the second step, something unexpected happened to Mary. Mary was discovered to be with child, and it did not belong to Joseph. Because they lived under the law, it could have invited Mary being stoned to death at the worst, or at least a public shaming at the best. But Joseph, seeming to be a God-fearing man, but a caring man, the Bible said that in as private a manner as he could, Joseph determined that he would just sever the initial contract. He didn't plan to point out Mary's apparent sin. He planned to just put her away. He'd do away with their espousal, and he would go their way, his way, and they'd part ways. Her with his disappointment, and then she with her soon-to-be revealed secret of bearing a child. But something happened before Joseph could could follow through with his letter of divorcement. The Bible said an angel showed up to Joseph. And here's the moment that we see the qualities of why God chose Joseph to be Mary's husband. Because just as surely as God chose Mary, God also chose Joseph. And he did because Joseph had a quality that brings him in from the cold, that draws him near to the heart of God. While Joseph thought on what he should do with Mary, the Bible said that he fell into a sleep. It was a troubled sleep, and an angel appeared to him in a dream. And the angel said, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. The angel reminded Joseph of a scripture. And when Joseph woke up, he got up and he took Mary, not to divorce court, but he took her to the justice of the peace to get married. The instantaneous obedience of a forgotten man. There's 66 books in the Bible. 1,189 chapters in the Bible. 783,137 words in the Bible. 3,116,480 letters in the Bible. And still, some people question God. And God's word. All Joseph needed was a dream in the middle of the night and an angel telling him, don't be afraid, God's on your side. And Joseph said, that is all I need to trust God. I understand, Joseph said, I'm the fifth wheel in this miracle. I understand this is something between God and Mary. But somebody has got to fill the role of the forgotten man. Somebody's got to be a father figure. Somebody's got to be snickered at behind wagging tongues. Somebody's got to endure the whispers of the calendar counters. Checking the dates from the marriage to the delivery. Somebody's got to raise a child that doesn't belong to him. Him. Somebody's got to turn their back on mother and father. Somebody's got to say, this is not about me. Somebody's going to have to forget themselves to be part of redemption's story. And Joseph said, I will be the one. It's not the last time Joseph displayed instantaneous obedience. Because the Bible said that Herod plotted, purposed in his mind, to kill all of the boys that were born in Bethlehem. And again, the Bible said in Matthew 2 that the Lord spoke to Joseph in a dream. Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. I want you to pay close attention to the wording of Scripture. The angel said, Arise 
and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be there, thou there, until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he, Joseph, arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into, into Egypt. You see the repetition there? Heaven didn't say, take your child and your wife. God said, take the young child and his mother. God told him that twice. Joseph this isn't about you. Joseph, you're an outsider in this story. Had Joseph been like most of us and not been the man that he was, probably he would have been resentful. Why is this child so upending my life? That's what most men would think. Why am I going here and am I going there? I don't want to go to Egypt. There's nothing in Egypt for me. I want to stay home. I want to watch the Super Bowl. That's what most men would say. Why am I being inconvenienced in Egypt? And why, of all the places in the world, why couldn't God send us to the Bahamas? He sends us to Egypt. But when he arose, after God spoke to him, he obeyed, and the Bible says that he obeyed instantly. Joseph forgot himself in the Lord, folks. I want to stop here for a minute. We'll either forget the Lord and in turn be forgotten by God, or we'll forget ourselves in the Lord. We will, to borrow words from Jesus, we'll lose our life for his sake, and in so doing, we'll find ourselves or we'll hold on to what we think is our life. And the Bible said we will ultimately lose it all. There's a lot of partially committed people in Scripture. Lots of partially committed people. The mixed multitude, a large group of people who tagged on when, 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 they, when they exited Egypt with Israel, who, who never left Egypt in their hearts. The, the, these people would die in the wilderness, never being able to see the promised land. Partially committed people limit what God can do for them when they're only partially committed. The king, he was another one who told the, uh, was told to, to, to take five arrows and fire him out a dying prophet's window. And the Bible said that when he was told to fire five arrows, he only fired three. If he'd emptied the quiver, he would have been given complete victory. But he was partially committed. And partially committed people are always critical of people who give full devotion. Partially committed people always make promises and never follow through. Partially committed people never understand the value of being sold out to God. Orpah. She journeyed with her fellow widow Ruth. But at some point in the journey, the Bible said that she stopped and she kissed Naomi goodbye. She had the same rights that Ruth had. Orpha had a, had a kinsman redeemer as well. But Ruth is in the Christmas story. Orpha's not. It's interesting that Ruth would become the ancestress of a shepherd boy by the name of David. And the Jews believe that Orpah became the ancestress to the giant named Goliath. And here's the problem that you need to remember, Mom and Dad and Grandma and Grandpa. The commitment level of one generation reaches to the next and the next and the next. So if you want to raise a godly family, if you want to secure a lasting heritage, there are going to be a lot of times that you're going to have to forget yourself and your preferences. 
You're thinking that it should be this way or that way. And you're simply going to have to say, yes, Lord. God never asked me if I thought that this was the way I should be saved. God never asked me if I wanted to repent of my sins. God never asked me if I thought it was okay that I be baptized in his name. God never asked me, do you think you ought to maybe get the Holy Ghost? He said, if you want to be saved, if you want to find salvation, you must repent of your sins and you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you must receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And just for those who are partially committed and always looking for a way out, the very next verse, before he even took a breath, he said, because the promise is unto you and to your children and to all them that are far off, your, your decision affects the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And somebody said, well, what if we believe something else? And Peter said in Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men. Whereby you get to contemplate whether or not you want to obey God. Whereby you get to decide whether or not you want to be partially committed or not. Whereby we must be saved. I'm not the smartest guy in this room, but I can read. And I read that if I'm going to be saved, I must repent of my sins. I must be baptized in Jesus' name. And I must receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that same Bible tells me that God doesn't respect any one person above another one. And so if he requires that of Brother Balt or Brother Petruzzi or me or Brother Victor, he re requires that of every single person that is in this room. You have not been forgotten by God. God made a way for you to be saved. And he made it plain. And he put it in his word. And he set it forth so that you could obey. And in order for you to be saved, you've got to forget yourself and remember God. going to have to say yes, Lord. Sometimes we take a less paying job to be more of a presence in the home. Sometimes we have to sever friendships and relationships that distract us from our primary purpose in life. Sometimes we accept ill will and criticism from people who don't know and will never understand where we're at. All because you know that you know that you know. And it may not necessarily be something that everybody else knows, but I've heard from God. And God told me to take that child and that woman and to take them to Egypt. And he would spare us there. And that if I would do the work of God, whether I'm known, remembered, or forgotten, God's going to raise up a Savior. And that Savior's going to redeem the world. And whether you remember my name is Joseph or not, I'm going to play a part in that. Because I'm going to forget myself, and I'm going to love God, and I'm going to work for God. Sometimes even in a forgotten role. And Joseph could have said, I'm forgotten. So forget this. But he didn't. The Bible said that he arose and he went to Egypt. And you know what happened in Egypt? You know what happened when he got to Egypt, Sister Barb? He had another dream. And an angel spoke to him again. Jesus is lost. Well, let me back up. Let me back up. I don't want to go to that one yet. 
he had another dream. And when he was there in Egypt, he's as lost as he thinks he can be. My God, I'm down here. I'm forsaken. I'm deserted. It's just me, Mary, and the baby. They've got God, and all that's got me. And he gets another dream. And this time the angel says, when you leave here, don't go back to Judea. Instead, I want you to go to the backwaters of Galilee. Are you kidding me? I don't get to go home. I got to go somewhere else and do something else. Now, some of us would have said, you know, if it wasn't for this brat and this woman, I could go home and live a comfortable life because I'm a carpenter and I've got a good trade and I could take care of myself. And he had that dream. The last appearance that we have of Joseph in Scripture is when Jesus was 12 years old and he'd taken Jesus to Jerusalem for one of the feasts. So all this time, he's raising this boy. All this time, He's taking care of this boy. And when they get to Jerusalem for the feast, Jesus is lost to Mary and Joseph. And when they find him, it's three days later. And when they find him, Jesus says to Joseph, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? That must have been the signal to Joseph that he was no longer needed. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. Thanks for your service up to this time. But your business, carpentry, that's not my business. And at that point right there, right there in Luke 2.49, Joseph fades from the scene. Because up until that point, They had called Jesus the carpenter's son. But now he has his true occupation. It's been in the Louvre for many years. Georges de la Tour painting. It's simply called Joseph the carpenter. Jesus is holding a candle. He's illuminating Joseph's work in the carpentry shop. And at his feet are two pieces of lumber. One horizontal and one vertical. It's a cross. In the picture, Joseph prepared Jesus for his real business. Jesus didn't come to be a carpenter. He came to be a redeemer. And Joseph, till he was 12, prepared him to do what needed to be done so that he could be about his father's business. And Joseph, when Jesus became 12, became forgotten. We don't read about him anymore in Scripture. Joseph was the forgotten man. The innkeeper, I'm almost done. The innkeeper, he's the forgetful man. He's the one that was forgetful. I told you I want to talk to you about the forgotten and the forgetful. So I'm going to take you back to that faithful faithful scene. Mary is expecting a baby. Stands there with Joseph at her side, standing in front of the innkeeper. Knock at his door, and they tell him we need a room. The innkeeper has a no vacancy sign, but he directs them to a place reserved for animals. A shed, a grotto, and that's where Jesus was born. The innkeeper's name is forgotten. They failed to write it in Scripture. And it should be. Some people say, well, at least he gave them a barn. Others say, well, they didn't have reservations. It's not the Holiday Inn. But I I think a miracle is about to come to pass. I think a miracle is about to come. So what? You don't have another room. Give them your room. Give them your room. See, he was the forgetful man. He was so encompassed with business so encompassed with staying busy that he forgot the father's business in his life. 
He was so wrapped up with trivial things that he missed the triumphant entry of the Savior of the world. He was so stressed about details that he missed the deity that stood at his door. It's Christmas amnesia. It's when all the chaos comes, when the stockings go up, when the calendar compresses, when we forget what really matters, distracted by a million and one things, losing sight of the one thing that really matters. Jesus stands at our door and he knocks and we say, go away, it's not convenient. I will serve you, but I'm waiting for a more convenient season. Isn't it ironic? It's Christmas time. It's the birth of the Savior. But in reality, what most of us say is, Jesus, we're too busy celebrating your birth to take time for you in our lives. That's where most people live. A few years ago, there was a boy. His name was Michael. He was celebrating his sixth birthday. Family and friends had been invited to Chuck E. Cheese in Boca Raton, Florida for this once-in-a-lifetime event. Boys only turn six one time in their whole lives. Hey, since we, does it, am I the only one that it bugs when everybody celebrates everything and they expect everybody else to give up, show up, and pay up? I probably ought to get back to Michael. I need to get back to Michael. So they go to Chuck E. Cheese. I hate Chuck E. Cheese. I hate the noise. I hate the, the token machines. I, cardboard pizzas. I don't like Chuck E. Cheese. But the party's over, and the children and adults, they all climb into separate vehicles, and everybody heads home. Everybody except the birthday boy. They left Michael. He was left behind. And employees found him at closing time wandering around the restaurant. And they called the police. Mom had already gone to bed. She didn't know about it till the next morning. She assumed that Michael had gone home with one of his cousins. I have eight grandchildren. How many of them were at my house last night? 20? Oh, I only have eight. There couldn't have been 20. It seemed like there were 20 of them in my house last night. I think there were four of them. When they get together, they go to the basement. I go up as many flights of stairs as we have in the house and get behind as many doors as I can get behind. Mom thought he, Mom thought he must have gone home with one of his cousins. Curious thing about this story for me is, is the boy's name is Michael. Michael is Emmanuel. His name was Michael Emmanuel. I don't can't say his last name. Michael Emmanuel. Mom forgets child at his birthday. It's possible to be celebrating the birth of Emmanuel and completely forget about the baby. The best way for us to prepare for the coming of Jesus is to never forget the presence of Jesus. It's difficult to stress the importance of remembering in the Bible or in life itself. In the Bible, the word remember is found more than 550 times. And the word's usually used as a command. God tells his people to remember him or to remember his ways or to forget not. The most common type of forgetfulness is absent-mindedness. Where my wife... I, I stand on dangerous ground at this point because my wife believes, I think, that she's a prophetess. And whenever I make fun of her for losing her keys, she strikes a, a prophecy on me that I'll lose my keys. And she claims that every time I make fun of her for losing her keys, I end up losing mine. Nobody loses their keys more than my wife. And the only thing she loses more than her keys is her phone. And it happens because she's absent-minded. She'll be working away, and she'll lay them down here, and then she'll go off and she'll do something else. And then she'll reach down where she's at, and it's not there, and she'll want to pick it up, and she'll want to get back to it and get going. And, and uh, 
She forgets it, right? Absent-minded is, where did I leave my keys? What time are we supposed to be there again? Anybody know what happened to my kid? Where's my clicker? Oh, there it is. That was staged. If you don't laugh at that, you're not laughing at anything else this morning, folks. Absent-mindedness. But a more serious type of forgetfulness is when we simply choose. I'm not going to remember that. Those kind of memory lapses are evidence that we've devalued the eternal in favor of the monetary. We forget God. We forget God's ways. We forget what God requires of us. We just choose, I'm not going to live the way that God wants me to live. I'm not going to do the things God wants me to do. And in those days, the innkeeper operated under the ancient law of hospitality. When somebody showed up and they didn't have any place, you made room for them. But he forgot God. Microsoft did a a study of 2,000 consumers recently. And they noticed that the human attention span continues to plummet. In 2000, in the year 2000, the human attention span was 12 seconds. And in 2018, the human attention span is 8 seconds. And that's noteworthy because the attention span of a goldfish is 9 seconds. And we now officially don't have the attention span of a goldfish. Folks, we got to remind ourselves over and over and over again. I'm almost done, I promise. What's important? That's why in, in the ancients, that's why the ancients had visible altars. That's why you could see the altars of the Lord that they built. That's why they built them in conspicuous places. The Bible said that while they were in the way, they built an altar. They built them in the way so that if you were going to bypass the altar, you had to go out of your way to bypass an altar. That's why they built them there. They had places where they would go to remember things that were meaningful. That's why we come here. That's the reason we come to church, so that we can remember, so that we can remember what's important, so that we can remember who should be important. We come to this building and gather together so that we don't forget the mercy and the grace of God in our lives. We come to this building and we worship together so that we don't ever forget that one day we were lost and undone. And God reached down. And in my case, he reached down into a horrible pit. And he drug me out of that pit. And he set my feet on a rock. And he established me. And he settled me. And he made a way. And I don't ever want to forget so I come here and I visit the altar that's in the way because if I'm going to be lost I'm going to go out of my way to be lost that's why we come here see the writer of the book of Hebrews says that it's possible that some have entertained angels unawares Jesus told his disciples, his followers, that when we do something for the least of these, we entertain Jesus unaware. How many of us here this morning, like the innkeeper, have Jesus right at our front door, right within touching distance, but we get distracted by things and people and money. Don't you know, don't you know that the innkeeper and his wife heard Mary groaning in the night giving labor to that baby? Don't you know that when that baby was born that the innkeeper and his wife Heard that baby cry in the stable. Don't you think somebody from Bethlehem became aware that somebody from Judea 
a member of the tribe of praise, was agonizing in childbirth. And yet, one by one, everybody rolled over. Everybody folded their hands. And everybody went to sleep while heaven was on high alert. Don't you forget God. You hear me? Don't you forget God. Because I got a question for you this morning. Are you more like Joseph or are you more like the innkeeper? There's a man by the name of Kieran McCarthy. Why don't you stand with me? He operates an exquisite antique shop in the city of London in England. And he is considered an expert on the Fabergé eggs. One day a few years ago, Mr. McCarthy was in his shop. And he looked up and there stood a man in blue jeans and plaid shirt standing in his shop looking completely out of place. And the man in England spoke a very obvious Midwestern United States accent. And it was obvious to Kieran McCarthy that he was uncomfortable. But the man explained to Mr. McCarthy that he had flown to London for the purpose of meeting with Kieran McCarthy. He told Kieran he'd seen his name on a Google search that he had done. The man from the U.S. was a junk dealer. He bought uh, storage units from people who did not pay their storage unit bills. And he would go through those storage units and he would place items for sale on the web. And he'd go to flea markets and he'd go here and he'd try to pawn things and buy things. And At a flea market, he bought a lot of scrap metal and he paid $14,000 for a lot of scrap metal that he knew he could sell and probably net twenty dollars to $25,000 off of that scrap metal. As he was going through the metal, he saw what he thought was an unusual item in a metal box. He opened the box and inside, wrapped in in a cloth, Sue opened up the cloth and there was this unusual item. And he saw that the item could be opened it and he opened it and it revealed a clock. He asked Kieran, if he could show him a picture of the item so Karen could maybe tell him what he thought it was. And he had taken a picture of it beside a muffin and a piece of paper so he could make sure he could tell the size of it. And when Karen McCarthy stared at the photo of the item that was placed on a kitchen counter next to a cupcake, he almost passed out. It was the holy grail of all Fabergé egg experts. One of the lost Fabergé eggs had somehow made its way into the United States and it had been placed in a box of junk metal and sold to a junk dealer at a flea market. Kieran McCarthy immediately demanded that the man let him go with him and see the egg. They went to the airport, they didn't even pack a bag. They went to the airport, bought tickets, boarded a plane to the United States, walked into the house, saw it on the counter, and as soon as he saw it, he knew this is a Fabergé egg. And it is the 43rd egg that was discovered. It was missing a gemstone or two, but because it was gold, it still had the luster that could not be denied. The gentleman from this, from, from the Midwest who, to this day, he still wishes to be made known, or not known, made anonymous. 
thought that he had something that he could melt down. And maybe, maybe he'd get 500 bucks for it. In a recent auction, the egg was sold to a private collector for $33 million. What was made as a gift to never be forgotten, somehow through the course of time, had been forgotten. A priceless treasure had become a junkyard relic. And but for the eye of an expert, a treasure could have been lost forever. Jesus Christ is a treasure in the field. By the field. Jesus Christ is a pearl of great price. You need to give everything that you can to obtain that. You remember the time when the disciples told Jesus? They said, we've left all to follow you. They said, we've lost our reputations. We've left our houses. We've left our families. We've lost ourselves in you, Jesus. And Jesus said to his disciples, if you forget yourself in me, there's nothing, nothing that you leave behind that won't be repaid many times over. And that promise is repeated in Matthew and Mark and in Luke. And this morning, what I see in Joseph and the innkeeper. There's two choices I have in my life. I can either forget myself in Jesus or I can be forgotten. I can simply forget about Jesus. I can be forgotten or be forgetful. Adam Clark says, it matters not the path on earth my feet are made to trod. It only matters how I live, obedient to God. I want to be forgetful when it comes to Jesus. I don't want to forget his benefits to me. I want to forget myself in him. If it requires it of me, then if God requires it, then I want to be lost in him not lost in eternity. Because Jesus said, if I lose my life for him, I'll gain everlasting life. I don't care if the world knows me. I don't care if anybody ever thinks I'm a great preacher. I don't think, I don't care if when I'm dead, my kids put my notes in a book and the book sells millions of copies. I don't care if I'm as famous as Charles Spurgeon I doubt that's going to happen. I don't care if I live in a mansion. I don't care if I drive a new car ever again. I don't have a new one now. I don't care if I ever drive another new one again. I buy used suits at a consignment shop. I don't care if I ever buy a new suit again. I don't care if I'm ever elected to any political office. I don't care if I'm ever elected to any political office in the UPC again. I don't care if people know my name and it rolls off of their tongues like water off a duck's back. I don't care about any of that. I don't ever want the Lord to forget who I am. I don't ever want to call on his name. And he say, I I recognize that name, but I don't recognize that voice. I don't know whose voice that is that's calling me. I don't ever want the Lord to hear me call. And him say, depart from me. Never knew you. I would rather be forgotten by everyone but Jesus and play whatever part I've got in somebody's redemption than to be so caught up in everything that's going on that I forget to take the time to simply be thankful 
for his goodness. If you're too busy to come to church, you're too busy. If you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. If you're too busy making money, you're too busy. If you're too busy enjoying the things of the world, you're too busy. You've forgotten Jesus, but he hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't forgotten you. Because see, in his eyes, we're the treasure that's inside the Fabergé egg. In his eyes, you are worth everything that he's ever done. You are worth him dying on a cross. You are worth him being born in a manger and not in the inn. You're worth the innkeeper not remembering the Lord at his birth. You're worth every struggle. You're worth every pain. You're worth every nail that was driven into his hand and every drop of blood that was shed. You're worth every day that he's waited for you to be in this place this morning and hear this preacher tell you that you are important to God. Don't forget him. Don't forget him. I wonder if there's somebody who loves him enough. It's one o'clock. I've preached almost an hour this morning. I never preached that long. So don't run home and tell somebody, my God, Brother Long preached an hour. I never preached this long. But it's Christmas time. We're worried about ornaments and presents and stockings and lights. And we forgot about the Savior. I wonder if there's somebody this morning that will step out of your seat. Come to this altar and just throw your hands up. Not Nobody's going to be praying with anybody, maybe. I don't know. But I'm just talking about you and your relationship with God, that you'll come to this altar and you'll say, God, I'm willing to be forgotten by everybody else, but I will not forget you. I don't care if anybody else knows anything about who I am or where I go. I will not forget your mercy to me on this, on this earth. I will not forget your grace that reached down to me. I will not forget that you loved me, God, when I was unlovable. I will not forget, God, that when I could not help myself, you robed yourself in flesh and you came and dwelled among us and you made a way for me. I will not forget you, God. You are my pearl of great price. You are my treasure in the field. And I'm not forgetting you, Jesus. I'm not forgetting you today.